God of word and deed, thought and action, prayer and praise, we give thanks for the opportunity to be fed by you and made whole. You desire the best for each one of us, and as we learn from you, we grow in holiness, and your gifts in us are released for your glory. Help us to make our relationship with you our top priority, so that all of our other relationships flow from the great well of your love and goodness. Amen. And please be seated. Well, it's good to see you this morning. So glad that some of you are in town and not away or not sitting by your air conditioners to come instead to be here, which is beautiful. This past week and taking some vacation days, one of the evenings I stayed in a, a trailer of a cousin of my father's who's not one who uses air conditioning. In fact, she doesn't open her windows for ventilation either. And I went in and I said, it was almost 90 in there. So I said, we, I, would you mind if we just open a few windows to let a little breeze in? Because I'm used to a little more circulation. And so, of course, we did that. But isn't it amazing what people can acclimate to, right? But uh, yes, I think for most of us, you are making a sacrifice to be in a, a warmer sanctuary. So thank you. And God, I know, is pleased that you come, even though we're not air conditioned. So um, let's take a moment to think about some of the things coming up. Bruce Megan left some bags with me for the midnight run. For those of you who would like to make sandwiches for the run, we have the sets of 10 bags, so thank you in advance. I'll have them right up here at the pulpit. You can pick them up after service if you're helping in that way. And be sure to let us know if you want to go on the run and you haven't already signed up, and we'll get the word to him. And um, that should be very good this Friday night. Also, um, I still have the jar of coins here, and I'd like to see if any of you are interested in being volunteer counters with me this coming week. And we just want to get a group together, have a little party. We can get some pizza or something and, and count up the coins, because I know our kids would like to know how many are in there and what it all added up to, and then we can get that money off to children's missions. So if anybody would enjoy counting and rolling coins, let me know. We can enjoy that together. Also, just in the bulletin, we noted that on the 24th, next Sunday, we're going to have a time of hymn singing in the service. So come with your favorites, ready for singing. And we also noted that Anita Holmes service will be here after church on Sunday, August 14th. We'll be interring her in the Memorial Garden. So those are our announcements for this morning. And I do want to also just say thank you to Clayton Miller, who covered for me while I was away this past week. So I don't see Clayton today, but I do want to thank him for being on call for any emergencies during the week. So we'll have the children's moment now. Follow the light, right? <laughs> That's a good game, like the cats. Do you do that with cats, with a laser pointer or something? Yeah. I'll have to try that with that. And then they try to get on the light. Well, that's, that's actually a good illustration. When we read the Bible, we're trying to follow God's light. And so we have to see, where's God going? What's God's light on us? So we follow, and we try to find it. And sometimes we have to move around a lot, don't we? So that's one thing about the Bible. It's like a lamp to our feet. <laughs> so that's a cool game. I'm going to remember that. Here's something else. Someone gave me a little anchor once. What do you use the anchor for with a boat? To stop the boat. To stop the boat. And if that's right, you drop the anchor, it's heavy, right? And it allows the boat to stay in one place. That can be helpful sometimes, right? The other time you want the boat to go out to sea and sail with wind or the motor, but the anchor keeps it in place. So how would the Bible be like an anchor for us? Any ideas? Keep us calm, good. Yeah, because it keeps us more calm to know about God's love for us, right? And that God is always there to help us. Do you want to say more about Keep us happy. Yeah, it makes us very happy to know about God's love. So yeah, it kind of keeps us strong, happy. Very good. 
So it's like the anchor holding the boat in place. It holds us in a relationship with God, right? It holds us in place. It's like we're attached to God, like the anchor's attached to the boat. It's heavy too, isn't it? Sometimes the Bible's a bit heavy too, right? Does anyone out there agree? Sometimes the Bible's a bit heavy? Because it has 66 books and there's a lot in there and sometimes people say, I how do we pronounce those names of the people in there? And there's a lot to learn about the Bible, so it can feel heavy because there's a lot to learn. But that's why we study it. And the words are too small, she says, right? Well, they do make large print Bibles too. <laughs> Sure. Well, you know, they make bigger print titles, too, but there's a lot to learn. But other things about the Bible, you know, this is a book of poetry here. Did you know there's poetry in the Bible? Yeah, there's poetry in the Bible, too. The Song of Solomon is a book of poetry. It's love poetry in the Bible, and the Psalms are very poetic, too. In fact, the Psalms were also sung, just like when you have song lyrics and you sing them, because I know you all like to sing. The songs were sung as worship songs to God. So we have poetry in the Bible that's sung or spoken. And then I have one more thing here. This is a history book. Did you know there's history in the Bible? What history would we have in the Bible? Any thoughts on that? Traveling, okay. It tells about people traveling together, like when Moses led the people out of Egypt and they traveled together and what they did, okay? So we have the history of the tribes of Israel. We have the history of the Jewish people. Donkeys and camels. Yes, there's something historic, right? How people lived in different times we learn about in the Bible too. That's right. That's absolutely right. So we learn about some of the ways they lived that might be a little different. They didn't have air conditioning back then, right? The air, the play. Fans, fan themselves, they would go into places that were cooler, depending on what they built things with, and caves and different things to be cooler, and the materials to keep cool. So we also learn history from the Bible. Yeah, that's way back, yeah. Drawings on the walls, right. So the Bible is a wonderful set of 66 books, and it, it's a lamp. Anchor, it's also history and poetry. And so we should never get tired of reading because there's so many different things to learn. And so as you grow older through Sunday school and as an adult as well, there's a lot to learn about the Bible and what it says in the Bible. The most important thing is to know that God loves us and we should love our neighbors. That comes through all of the Bible. Well, let's say a prayer together. Oh God, thank you for the books of the Bible that tell us of how you have spoken to many different people and tribes of people, the Jewish people, and then later to non-Jewish people as well who got to know the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and to follow him. Lord, we thank you that today too you speak to us as well. And you speak to us in many different ways. I ask you to guide our children and make them strong and joyful and give them life in their path. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Psalm 119, verses 33 through 45. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give my, me light in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise. It is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have one for your precepts, and your righteousness give me life. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Then I shall have an answer for those who taught me, for I trust in your word. 
do not take the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for my hope is in your ordinances. I will keep you in law continually, forever and ever. I shall walk at liberty, for I have sought your precepts. New Testament, it's Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 16, and 24 through 26. Dear best, present yourself to God as one approved by Him, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. Avoid profound chatter, for it will lead people into more and more infertility, and the word servant must not be quarrelsome, but kindly to everyone, an apt teacher, patient, correcting opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant that they may will repent and come to know the truth, and that they may escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, Jesus visits Martha and Mary. Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, but which will not be taken away from her. The word of the Lord. Now let us rise and sing thy word as a lamp, 601. Bar signs, by the way, that's 
the humorous side of Aunt Jean. She, she has quite a collection, and I, I was actually able to add one to her collection recently as I was driving by a, a bar. Uh, I don't think Wesley would approve of the sign because it, it talked about the bar being a babysitter for husbands. Uh, to send your husband here, we'll take care of him while you go shopping, while you'll have to do is pay the bill sort of thing. But anyway, but Aunt Jean recently had a post that, um, in addition to sharing that post of mine, she, she had a rather thought-provoking post, and she said, I have a confession to make. Many of you know I am a practicing Catholic. Not necessarily a good one, but I'm working at it all the time. And most Catholics aren't strict Bible beaters by any stretch of the word. But I still feel the need to confess ten things I don't believe about the Christian Bible, Old and New Testaments. Okay, make that eleven things. So here they go. She says, one, I don't believe the Bible was dictated by God. Two, I don't believe the Bible explains the time and manner of Earth's creation and population accurately. Three, I don't believe the Bible accurately represents women for the times in which we live. Four, I don't believe the Bible has much of consequence to say about gender identity and sexual orientation. Five, I don't believe the Bible provides a unified, consistent message regarding marriage, war, violence, or sex. Are the walls falling in yet? <laughs> Does lightning come down yet? I don't know. Uh, six, I don't believe the Bible is without error. Seven, I don't believe the Bible is the only source through which we hear or experience God. Eight, I don't believe the Bible should guide our government. Nine, I don't believe the Bible can be objectively interpreted or evaluated. Ten, I don't believe the Bible is worthy of worship. In other words, only God is. And eleven, I don't believe the Bible should be used to defend the Bible. So that's it, she said. I feel much better now. That's Aunt Jean's confessions. Well, that's a pretty heavy, provocative set of statements, isn't it? She happens to be married to my Uncle Bob, who is a United Methodist pastor, retired and retired Air Force chaplain. Um, I don't know if he agrees with Aunt Jean on all of the things that were posted, and at this point in his journey, I don't know if he would be able to share whether he did. Um, he's not as well. But anyway, very interesting. Looking at that list, I'm a wee bit uncomfortable. Is anybody a little uncomfortable? And at the same time, maybe some of them I would say, yeah, I resonate with that. I understand where she's coming from. She doesn't want to align herself with those who use the scriptures as a weapon to bash science or other religions or to set back women's equality, or other civil rights struggles. And so she's making that very, very clear right up front where she's at. And yet it's interesting that she calls it her confession, isn't it? Because some part of her says, but I want to, I want to hold on to the Bible as my light, as the inspired word, in spite of those questions and concerns. And so I think that's where many of us find ourselves today, is we love the scriptures. The scriptures have nurtured our faith. The scriptures have given us things that Sheena mentioned earlier, joy and strength, and connected us to God in some profound ways, and yet we wrestle too. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. As Methodists, we believe in scripture, reason, tradition, and experience, with our reason, tradition, and experience helping us to interpret the scripture. I think it's worth mentioning, though, that the scriptures have a lot in them to move forward relationship to all groups of people and to other religions. Again, it's all in how you utilize the Bible and looking at the overarching principles of the Bible and interpreting through ethical overarching principles that run through it, not pulling verses out of context. And so, there's much that has happened in a progressive movement in our world because of the scriptures and because people study the scriptures. Women's rights, for example, a lot of the early reformers were people who found strength in the Bible as well. Yes, they critiqued some passages, but they also found strength and self-worth in what God said about them as children of God. So I believe in the benefits of scripture study and the Bible is still a light for me personally, a source of strength, a source of joy, as I hope that it is for you. But not simply.
simply as a means of indoctrination, though doctrine can be fascinating to study, but as a means of inspiration and opening us up to the big questions of life. Who is God? Who am I? What is our purpose? When the Bible opens us up to those questions, gets us even thinking about that instead of just, you know, whether we need the next Dunkin' Donuts beverage on our journey or who posted what on Facebook, unless it's Aunt Jean's, then that one's okay, because that was thought-provoking. If it opens us up to the big questions, then it's a good thing. But it's interesting, you know, when Paul writes to Timothy in his second letter, which I chose from the New Testament text today, he expresses his belief in scripture as that which corrects us and gives us all we need to know for salvation. It's often quoted by people who say that the Bible is inerrant. They say, look what it says in 2 Timothy. It gives us everything we need to know, therefore it's inerrant. That means that there's nothing we could find in there to disagree with. But you have to also remember that Paul wrote this epistle before the New Testament came into being. Isn't that interesting to think about? So he's really talking about the Hebrew Scriptures. He's not even talking about what we would call the Christian Bible, right? And we also have to remember that the Gospel's primary means of being spread in those times was orally, testimonial. I've met the risen Lord. Think about Saul who became Paul and how most of his testimony in the beginning was oral and then later it was through the epistles he's writing, but it wasn't a sense of inerrancy. When he wrote a letter to someone, he wasn't thinking my letter is inerrant. He was thinking I'm sharing what God's doing in my life and what I'm hearing from God, but not expecting to be inerrant. So I think that's important to remember as we study scripture. But I like the portion of that text that says, study to show yourself approved, a workman that need not be ashamed. Because that's also a good reminder to us as today's Methodists, we're living in a culture where we don't study scripture a lot, right? We're living in a culture where a lot of people don't even know much of what's in the Bible at all. And so there's real value in studying scripture and having Bible study discussion. I want us to to get some Bible study groups going again for this later summer and fall so that we can engage in that discussion, prayerful study. And the beautiful thing is we won't all agree on every interpretation. We won't hear everything the same way. As Aunt Jean said wisely, it can't be objectively interpreted. Each time we interpret, it's a person interpreting with all their lens and all their baggage. Right? But we can together discern, and there are things that we'll agree on. Like loving God and our neighbors, I don't think anyone's going to dispute that, right? So studying and discussing together helps us to fine-tune our relationship and to keep engaged in that relationship. It's a kind of accountability that we do want to engage the holy texts that have come to us, that are a treasure to us. And where we find things problematic in them, we can talk about that. What's problematic about it? Why? And what can we learn from that? So a healthy relationship to scripture for me is one that awakens the universal questions about meaning and purpose in life and our desire to be in relationship with our creator. Mary, the sister of Martha, sits at Jesus' feet. And so when I thought about that text, I thought of it in relationship to Bible study and studying Jesus' words and talking about them together as one form of Bible study. But I think we also have a beautiful corrective in that text that says she was listening to his words and we can also listen directly to Jesus. He speaks to us today, does he not? So we also have prayer and we can sit at Jesus' feet by sitting in prayer or walking in prayer. Some people pray as they walk. That can be a nice way to pray. I find sometimes driving and praying, not taking eyes off the road, but reflecting and talking to God while you're driving. Sometimes even listening to Christian radio, whether it's music or talk radio, and then reflecting on what you're hearing theologically can be a kind of prayer. So Mary chose the better half, Jesus said. She chose the better portion. She wanted to hear what he had to say about God in relationship to God. Instead of just getting distracted by all the food that was being put out and the things that they were doing for hospitality, where Martha was all distracted with that, but Mary focused on God and learning through Jesus. So, again, it's a beautiful reminder that through scripture, through prayer, through discussion, we also can listen to God. We can make that 
an important part of our life that guides us and brings us light. I'm reminded of Jesus when he talks about how when he was left at the temple, when he was a young boy, and he said, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? He had a hunger to know as much as he could from the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, and from the teachers. He was hungry to learn about God. That's the kind of hunger that we should have. And we'll find that as we have that hunger, more and more questions arise. Do you ever find that? The more you study scripture, the more questions come up. So it doesn't always make it easier to understand as we study, but it raises new questions. That's okay, because it keeps us growing. Psalm 119.40, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts. Quicken me in thy righteousness. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. Give me understanding. Incline my heart unto thy testimony. So, the psalmist is talking about a strong passion to know God. And that's what God wants from us. A strong passion to know God. So one of Aunt Jean's friends wrote in response to her Facebook post, well, I believe that the scriptures are a reflection of the history of the Jewish people and God. The Hebrew scriptures are, and then the history of the early church and their relationship to God. And I think there's truth in that. It's an evolving relationship. Just as we as church today are evolving in our relationship to God. And I think that's okay to acknowledge that. It's not static. It's an evolving relationship. So that's a good thing. At the same time, we don't want to just see the Bible as history or historic narrative as remembered by the writers, because when we just see it as history, then it loses some of its power. We also believe that the scriptures are anointed by the Holy Spirit for our instruction, correction, inspiration, and our instructions on how to live. So we don't want to lose that either. And so I think what makes me a little uncomfortable about Aunt Jean's post is I have a little bit of fear, too, that we can so take away from the specialness of the Bible that we can lose the power of the scriptures, too. And that would be a shame. People didn't even want to read them and didn't feel that they needed them at all to know God. And I feel they have much to say to us about God. So this is times that we're living in where so much is happening, I think every week we say, wow, another terrorist attack, horrible, in Nice this past week. Um, you know, before that we were reeling from violence, from police shootings, which of course there may be different opinions about when we were justified and all of that, and then we heard the horrible shootings of officers and so many things happening. And so can the scriptures help us grapple with these things? I believe they can, but not in a simplistic way. It takes dialogue, it takes study to try to, try to discern what's happening today. And so we need to get together. We need to, to talk about issues that matter. We need to look at it all together. I talked about evolving understandings too in the church. I don't know if all of you know, but we had election of bishops this past week. And we now have a new bishop assigned to our area. We also had an historic election and that one of our bishops elected was Reverend Karen Alavito, a lesbian pastor from San Francisco, or out in San Francisco, originally from Long Island. And of course, because our denomination has some division in theology, it will be interesting to see how this unfolds. But it does seem to me that in Loving God and neighbor, it's good to have representation of the various groups of people that are part of the United Methodist Church. We have female bishops, we have bishops of different skin colors, and now we have a bishop of a different sexual orientation for the majority of the bishops. So, as we study scripture, we do so with love for neighbors and with a respect for other disciplines too, sciences and psychiatry and sociology, and we look with intelligence, reason, tradition, and experience. We don't interpret in a vacuum. But what a great topic to look at as well in Bible study. I'd love to do a Bible study where we look at why are some Christians moving away from some of the older understandings that said it was not compatible with Christian teaching to be gay or lesbian, or perhaps some have used scripture to say one should not transition 
and so forth. Be interesting to look at the arguments on both sides together. Pull out our Bibles, and we may not all come to the same conclusions, but the point is to engage around what matters in our world today, what's happening in our world today. We need to engage so that it doesn't seem random when change happens, but change happens through Bible study, prayer, and engagement with God, and that's what I believe is happening. Not randomly, but through engagement with God. Micah 6.8 says, do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And as I was driving back from vacation, that verse kept coming into my mind in relation to today's message, because how do we walk humbly with God if we think only I have the right interpretation of Scripture, right? If each of us says, I have it right, someone else definitely has it wrong, that's not humble. But we can say, this is what I believe, this is what I've discerned, this is where I am at on my journey, that respect that others are in a different place. That's walking humbly with God. I went through a period of time when I had an equation of literal reading of each verse, even pulled out of context, and faithfulness. So literalism and faithfulness, that went together for me. And this wasn't a very long period of time, but I decided I'm going to just try to apply as literally as possible. And so I was troubled about the Bible saying some things about if you marry again, you make an adulterer of your spouse. And so I, I actually told a couple I couldn't do a second marriage. They came, they were both getting married for a second time. I, I'm sorry, I can't do that right now. It's just where I'm out of my journey. Now I thought, oh gosh. But I actually did that. But then afterward, I had to wrestle because then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you know, you're trying to be so literal, but where's the compassion? Where's the, the fact that I love when people fall in love and make a life? And what about the God of new beginnings? And what about the God of, of new chapters and second chances and everything else? And so, of course, now I have a whole different theology with respect to second marriages. But that's just an example of what can happen when we try to pull a verse or two and say, I don't know, let's, let's rely on that verse. And don't use maybe our heads and our hearts and our reason and our common sense as well in interpreting scripture. I'm very fond of the book, The Year of Living Biblically by A.J. Jacobs. Anybody read that? It's, it's a fun book. Um, A.J. Jacobs was raised in a Jewish household, but a secular Jewish household. He really didn't have a lot of training in the scriptures, but he decided that he was going to try a very literalistic application of a lot of different verses. And so um, the book has some humor in it about trying to apply certain verses that maybe really don't apply well in the modern world. But he also found that he, he learned a lot on the journey. For example, the commandment against a graven image awakened in him a, a greater sense of how images can be used to manipulate and how we can have a cult of personality around famous people in politics and in entertainment. So he began to grapple with a lot of, a lot of the scriptures. But he also walked through Manhattan with a sheep and a staff, <laughs> and he grew his beard according to the scripture. He did a lot of different things. He may be rather controversial in Judaism. I don't know how you know, our Jewish friends would feel about the book, but I found it to be a very interesting book because it just showed once again that we can say, I believe everything in the scriptures, I'm going to apply it all, and good luck trying, right? Good luck trying to apply every verse since some seem to have a different viewpoint than another. The Bible was written over a long historical period, and so as we know, the same matter might be treated differently in one book and another. So good luck, right? And that's what he found. He also talked to pastors and rabbis along the way, and this is a quote that one of the people talked to, he talked to said that it was very interesting. This was um, a pastor. He said, never blame a text from the Bible for your behavior. It's irresponsible. Anybody who says X, Y, and Z is in the Bible, it's as if one says, I have no role in evaluating this. So that was a thought provoker for A.J. Jacobs. He said, that idea that we can work with God to understand the Bible's meaning, it's a thrilling idea. He said, Greenberg says that just because you're religious doesn't mean you give up your responsibility to choose. You have to grapple with the Bible. And as Methodists, I'm sure we would agree with that. 
So let me just close the sermon by saying that I believe that the Bible helps me center on God. It does give me light and strength and joy, but also gives me many questions and many things to wrestle with. It can shine a spotlight on our own lives and make us confess, as Jean perhaps felt she was confessing at the same time as she was stating her beliefs. And it can affirm if we're doing something that God wants, like for example, the Midnight Run, it can help us to know we're on the right track. God wants us to help those in need. But as we do so, we do need to engage reason, tradition, and experience in our interpretation. And we need to engage each other, not read the Bible in a vacuum, but do so together. So I hope we can get some Bible study groups going and start wrestling together a bit more with the scriptures. Let us pray. O oh, holy God, in this ever-changing world, Help us to remember that your love for us and your desire to be present to us is unchanging. Help us to study and delve into your scriptures and to listen to you in prayer and in the voice of other people. Always of listening at your son's feet like Mary. Let our study, our conversation, and our prayer renew our hearts, renew our faith, so that we might be ever more pleasing in your sight. Amen. So now is our time to come before God in the spirit of confession. Let us join in the prayer found in the bulletin. O oh God, we have all sinned against you in word and deed. We have compromised our ideals, given in to pressures of those around us, and made poor decisions. We have lived with regret. Yet in Jesus Christ, you have offered us a way to release the past and move forward with your forgiving grace abounding. This very day, we forgive ourselves and others as we have been forgiven clearing our vision to perceive with fresh eyes, unclouded by guilt and blame, freeing our hearts to leap for joy, and our lives to bring you daily glory. Praise you, Father of mercies, in Jesus' name. Amen. In Christ, we are continually made new. Thanks be to God. And let us worship God now with our tithes and offerings.
bless these offerings. Bless the offerings of our hearts, our questions, our convictions, our love, our passion to know you. Be with us in the week ahead and in all of the weeks and months ahead as we serve you. Amen. Amen. And please be seated. And let us continue now in our time of prayer. Almighty and everlasting God, God whose very nature is relationship, Father, Son, and Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer of life. Thank you for your presence with us. Thank you for giving us a hunger and a desire to know you even more, to walk closely with you, to learn of your ways, which are not our ways, which are higher than our ways. Help us to learn trust and discernment, to find the balance between questioning and studying and simply having a simple faith and reliance upon you. We can't do it without your help, O oh God. Today, O oh God, we lift up to you those places that have had terrible turmoil this past week, the people of Nice, France, in the wake of terrorism, and the people of Turkey, where there has been violence and unrest. Lord, we pray for our nation and its peoples and for our leaders and for this election year. And we pray, oh God, that you will help us as a nation to work together to, to be one and united for the good. Oh Lord, hear these other prayers that we lift aloud at this time. These are just a few of the concerns and the praises that we lift to you. Hear us now as we pray the model prayer your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So our final hymn reminds us again that used well the Bible can undergird our Christian life with goodness and truth. Let's turn to How Firm a Foundation, 529.
us. Walk as a friend with us and make us into instruments of God's peace, God's shalom. Amen.